back tonight. Good to worship together and to learn more about God's Word through Bible study tonight on a Wednesday night. Um, hope you are doing well, and I hope you continue to uh, enjoy uh, the services that we're having. Uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer tonight, let's continue to remember those who are sick. We have a uh, someone in our church family who has a family uh, member who um, has the virus, and so we want to be praying for them um, and that God would move in them. I, I won't mention their names since this will be on uh, social media, but um, y'all know who they are if you go to this church, but just keep, the Lord knows who they are. That's the most important thing. So let's pray for them, and we have other people in our church that aren't feeling well, uh, or have other ailments in their body, let's continue to remember them and that God would minister to them. Let's remember our community um, as the uh, as we see more cases in, in around uh, Harrisonburg in this area. Um, let's uh, remember everyone there. Uh, let's pray that God would help us to get back together soon um, and that this thing will get better soon so that we could uh, join together and worship together inside the church. Um, and uh, let's continue to pray and ask God to do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We praise you for another opportunity for us to study your word, for us to uh, worship you and to magnify you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Lord, we pray for healing for those who are sick, Lord. You know their names, and Father, I pray that you would give healing to those who are sick, Lord. I pray that you would bring healing to those who have ailments in their bodies, Lord, those who have, have, have swelling in their legs, Lord, I pray that you would uh, reduce that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Those who have having pains in their body, Lord, I pray that you bring healing to that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you bring joy to those who aren't feeling joy tonight, Lord, I pray that you bring peace to those who aren't ha feeling that peace tonight, Lord, may, they, may your spirit comfort them tonight and give them peace tonight as we study your word and as we worship together. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. You know, there are several things that I miss about uh, being together and worshiping together and um, on Sunday nights gathering together in Bible study and on Wednesday nights gathering together for Bible study. But one of the things I miss the most is on Sunday mornings hearing our children be able to sing and hearing our teenagers at times be able to sing and to worship God and to lead us into worship. Uh, but tonight we got something special for you. Uh, Cherith and Mariah are going to lead you in a worship song tonight. So would you worship with them? Would you uh, praise the Lord with them as they lead you uh, in 10,000 Reasons? Let me. 
the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Thank God for our, our kids and our teenagers. I wish all of our kids could be here to sing together, but uh, Cherith and Mariah represent all of them, and we love each and every one of them. Children, we want you to know if you're watching that we love you, we miss you just as much, and uh, we look forward to a time when y'all can get together in Sunday school class and to in and, and, and youth group and be able to do things together and uh, and unfortunately this is where we have to be right now but we're looking forward to that time where you guys can join together too and be able to worship God together and learn together um, praise the Lord we hope that you're doing well we hope that you're being obedient to your parents and we hope that you are uh, doing well in your school work uh, right now and you're enjoying this time that you have at home with your family well, let's go into the Word. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you want to go ahead and turn there while I'm talking about it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If, if, you know, if I had to give you a title tonight, I would call it Instructions for the Church. Paul, last time we were together in the beginning of chapter 5, he told us about the rapture. He told, he began to tell us about how we need to be different from light and from darkness. And we are the light and the world lives in darkness. And we need to um, be a people that there's a difference in us. Uh, but Paul was reminding them to continue to walk in the light, continue to be the light of the world. Uh, and now in the last part of chapter 5, he begins to tell them how the church should function in these last days and how they should live. I actually preached a message on this. I referenced that last week, uh, but I preached a message on this a, a couple of months ago, and uh, my my first inclination was just to skip this chapter altogether, but that would be fair to those who weren't here that Sunday and, and got the rest of the Bible study just to skip a chapter in the book and get to the last chapter and, and, and skip that. But I, I hope um, tonight that you'll find that I, I'm giving you something a little bit different tonight than what I would in that sermon. And uh, I have, as I've studied this uh, uh, more deeply, I have, uh, have gone back and, and got some more points here. And hopefully we can learn and get something from God's Word uh, tonight. Uh, he continues, uh, Paul in this scripture, you'll see in these last few verses, Paul begins to he doesn't begin to, he has been, but he, he tends to do this a little bit more in this last part. He calls them brethren. He continues to call them brethren. Now, he, he, he's meaning that towards the sisters in the church too, but he's trying to give a connection there. We're family. We're the family of God, and we worship together, and he's trying to help them understand that I'm not above you in the kingdom, that we all need to worship together. We need to glorify God together. Um, and he's trying to promote this sense of unity by using that word brethren. We won't look at that every time he says that tonight, but I want you to see that every time uh, we mention that in the scripture. So he focuses on three things here. He's focusing on three things in these last 17 verses of, of 1 Thessalonians 5. It's, he talks about leadership first. Then he talks about fellowship. And then he the last several verses of this chapter he, he talks about worship and what worship should look like in the last days and in the church that God has um, ordained for us. Um, and so as we look at this, I want you to look at how you are helped by your Christian family. How are you helped by your Christian family? And then in turn, I want you to think also, how do I help others? These might make me two questions that you might as a family want to talk about uh, in your devotions um, this week. Uh, how, how are you helped by your Christian family? And how do you help your Christian family based on uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 18? So let's begin by looking at verse 12 and verse 13. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. In, in verse 12, he uses that word, admonish you. He says, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, those who work among you, those who are ministers among you, 
those who try to help you and are over you in the Lord and they admonish you. What does that word admonish mean? That word admonish there, uh, in the Greek it means to warn. And even in the definition of it in Webster's, it means to warn or to reprimand. Now most of us would love to just be encouraged all the time. Most of us would love to be just told what we're doing good all the time instead of people warning us or having to reprimand us. But you know, correction is good. Uh, we, we, we talk about that, especially when we're dealing with our children. Sometimes it's really, it, it, punishment is good at times because it teaches us the right way. A reprimand or a warning from a leader is just telling you, look, I see that you're going down the wrong path and I, I'm, I'm trying to teach you this is the way we need to be going and, and trying to show you the word of God. It's the responsibility of the leaders of the church to shepherd the flock. And sometimes that means to encourage them and to lead them to the green pastures and refreshing waters. But when they are straying from the flock and ultimately the word of God and the kingdom of God, it is also the job of the shepherd to prod them back. A loving shepherd would always do that. He wouldn't let a sheep just go astray without trying to prod them back into the fold. It's never the job of pastors to lord over the people or put ourselves on a pedestal. You hear people quoting scriptures like this all the time. Touch not God's anointing and do his prophets and no harm. But this scripture is not a license for you to be able to just do whatever you want. And when I say you, I'm talking about leaders. We, we, don't, we, can't, we can't just do anything we want and just use that scripture as our defense. Because uh, I believe that it is true that we, we shouldn't touch God's anointed. We shouldn't do his prophets harm when they're preaching the word of God. When they're giving good instruction. When they're, when they're um, living a sound life according to the word of God. Um, but there are some who, who call themselves men of God that need to be criticized and some even ostracized from the church because they're not living the life that they should. I've, I've seen too many people and too many leaders in churches that are not living the life that they, that they should be, but the people continue to defend the leaders because they're scared to to touch the anointed of God and what they perceive as the anointed of God. And really, a lot of times, it's just talent. And it's not really anointing. But God, God has called us as pastors to do a work. And, and if we're living by the Word of God and we're following the Word of God, then, then we should be able to instruct in the Word of God. And sometimes the Word of God hurts. Because it's not what we want to do. We're being admonished. We're being warned. We're being reprimanded by the word of God. But those times are growing times for us where we could, we could make a choice. We could kick back at that and we could refuse to hear the warnings or the reprimand or we could receive that constructive criticism and move on in Christ and move to a different level in Christ and draw closer and closer to Him through the instruction of those who have, who have the wisdom to see what's going on in our lives. Paul says, Those who are laboring among you and are over you and warn or reprimand you in love, these we should honor. Show them how much you love them with a combination of appreciation and, and affection. I, I'm, I'm speaking to myself too because I have people that are leaders over me. I have people who are bishops over me that I have to answer to. I have people that I, I have to uh, follow their instruction and their guidance. And, and sometimes if I'm not doing right, they would have to reprimand me. I'm fortunate enough that I haven't had to have that happen to me. But if I wasn't doing right, I want somebody to tell me. I want people in my church to tell me, hey, brother, you, what you preached, I don't agree with it. And then we can sit down and talk about it. And I've had that happen before. And we've, we've talked about that. Sometimes it, it's a salvation issue. Sometimes it's not a salvation issue. It's just a discussion of Scripture. And there's no reason to uh, have disunity over that. We can agree to disagree and love one another. And we can keep walking on. But the Scripture tells us in the midst of that, that we should 
We, we, we should know the ones who labor in us and over us and esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. This is a difficult thing for me to preach because it, it might seem like I'm trying to get more accolades for what I'm doing. I'm not. I'm just trying to teach uh, what's here in this scripture. And, it, and it's, uh, it's something that we all should do. It's something that we need to do. We need people to help guide us and lead us. I don't care how high up you are. If you feel like you can't take instruction, then that's a problem. And we need to be able to take instruction. So how do, we, how do we honor those above us? One of the greatest ways you can do that is to be at peace amongst yourself. The scripture, that last verse 13 says, and be at peace amongst yourself. One of the greatest things as a pastor that I can say is when, when the church is in unity, that makes my job a lot easier. When they're at peace with one another, it makes my job a lot easier. And I, I, we have a great group of people here at Redeeming Grace, and thank God for that. And that's just not words. That's that's a that's a heartfelt uh, that's a heartfelt thing for me, your pastor. Thank God for a church people that get along and live in unity. And that's the greatest thing for a pastor to see. It's a great thing for a pastor to see that, that families are living together in unity and, and we can get together, we can fellowship on Sunday nights and we can get together on Sunday mornings and, and, and worship together without there seeming to be divisions amongst the church and some sit on this side and some sit on the other side. It's a great thing to do that and, and when we live at peace amongst ourselves, it's one of the greatest things we can do to show the love to our pastor and to our leaders of the church, not just me, to those who lead in worship, to those who lead the youth, to those who lead uh, our children, uh, for all those who are leaders in our church, for the ones who are deacons on our board. It, 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 it's refreshing to us when we don't, we, we don't have to worry about people living in unity. The enemy's always trying to disrupt that because he, he wants to disrupt that in the church. But we've got to be able to recognize that. There is nothing that warms the heart of a pastor more than unity among the flock. Verse 14 and 15 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Verses 12 and 13, we talked about leadership. Verses 14 and 15, he begins to talk about fellowship. How do we deal with one another? What do we do for one another? And God uses us to help one another to remain holy and sanctified. And God will use each and every one of us to do that if we allow him to do that. One of the first things he said, or the first thing he says here, is warn them that are unruly. That word unruly, if you look that up, it, it actually means disorderly. That Greek word means disorderly or out of step. It actually gives a connotation of a military uh, group, that there's somebody who's out of step or out of line of where everyone else is uh, in that congregation and in the kingdom of God. And so when people come out of that step, then we have to warn them to get back in step. And we have a vision as a church, and we have, uh, and, and the scripture gives us that vision. We, we ought to go out to all the world and preach the gospel. We ought, to, we ought to love people around us. And when people get out of that vision, when people get out of line of that, we warn them. We, we, we tell them, look, brother, I see there's some things in your life where you're getting out of step of where you should be. And, and most of the time when they come out of the vision of the church is because they're coming, they're, they're, they're separating from the walk of Christ. And they're beginning to fade away. And, and I would want someone to come tell me if I was walking out of relationship with Christ. But on the flip side of that, if you're the one that's doing that, you've got to be willing to accept the warning. You've got to be one that's willing to accept what people are telling you. Those who are living their lives unruly and those who are disorderly in the church, refusing to walk in unity, we should warn those who are not living the life that God would, ple would be pleased with. But most of us, we steer away with this, from this because we don't want to offend people. But there's a way to warn people in love. And I don't believe we should be going out rebuking everyone we see that's not living the way we think they should live. But there is, there is a way to do that in love. There's a way to sit people down and help them understand 
that you love them and that you care about them, and that's the reason why you're talking to them. Now, if 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 they if you speak to them and they don't want to hear it and they don't want to walk in it, then that becomes a them problem. As I like to say, it's not a you problem then. You've done what God has told you to do. You've done what the Word of God tells you to do. As long as you did that in love, and, and if they don't want to accept that, then at least the blood is off of your hands. You have done what you can to draw them back. But it's our obligation as a church to help one another and to encourage one another to stay on the right path. And you can do that without destroying them if they really want to grow in Christ. Then he tells us to comfort the feeble-minded. The feeble-minded here may sound like we're talking about dumb people, but that's not what it is. It actually, if you look it up in the Greek, and I, I'm going to give you a lot of that tonight, but if you look it up in the Greek, it actually means little-spirited, faint-hearted. I, I, would, I would say these are the babes in Christ. These are the ones who haven't known the Lord long and haven't been in a relationship with Christ long, and they just don't know. They're, they're not dumb. They're, if you would call it, ignorant. Uh, they don't know the Word. There's a difference in being stupid and just not being taught yet. And there's a lot of babes in Christ that are feeble-minded because they just haven't been taught yet. They don't know the Word of God like you do. And a lot of times... For, for those of us who have been in church all our lives, I've been in church for 41 years now. I've been in church all my life, um, almost 42 now. I've been in church all my life. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was five years old. But I can't expect everybody to walk with the, in their relationship with Christ like I do. I can't expect everybody to know the Word like I do because I've been in church all my life. But what I can do is walk beside them and help them to comfort them, to relate. The, the word comfort there means to relate near or to encourage. To draw close to them, encourage them. Make them feel like they can come to you. They can draw near to you to get that encouragement. And a lot of times we don't, even though you might want people to do that, we don't, we don't open ourselves up to make them feel welcome to come to us. But we need to tell people, hey, look, if you need anything, come to me. If you, have any, if you have any questions, please ask instead of not knowing. And I want to help you walk in Christ. We need to disciple these young people in, in the Lord. When I say young people, they could, be, they could be old people, but young in Christ. And we need to help them walk in Christ. It is the job of the pastor, but also the lay people in the church to stay near to those who have recently converted to Christ. Encourage them. Disciple them. And then it tells us to support the weak. That word support means to hold one's hand. Hold up those who are weaker than you. Not everyone is strong. It is easy, and, and this is the truth, it is easy for us who are strong in the Lord to just expect others to be strong as well. And I, I can tell you, in the flesh, it is frustrating when people aren't as strong as I think they should be because they have been saved for a certain amount of years, and I would think they should be stronger than what they are. But some people are just weaker in areas than other people are. And it might just be one area that you're, you're, you're stronger than they are. And it can be frustrating. And if we're not careful, then, then we will uh, come off as we don't care about them. But we need to care about them, in, them enough to even support them, to hold them up. To hold them up in prayer. To hold them up with encouraging words. To, to help them to come along to get stronger in the Lord. Some are weak and need to be held up. Some people have strong temptations in their lives. And some people are going to always have those temptations. Paul said, I had a thorn in my flesh. I, I, he, he had something that kept bothering him. And that was a weakness of his. But he understood that he had to put his trust and his faith in Christ. And he had other brothers walking beside him that would help him to do that. And as a church, we need to do that for those who have weak areas. We need to help them to understand how to overcome those things. But understand that they're going to have those temptations, but they can stay away from those temptations and help them to understand how to do that. But they can defeat those things in their lives. Their faith 
Some people, their faith is just not as strong. For some of us, when things happen to us, we just believe God's going to work it out. Some people, some Christians, good Christian people, when things happen to them, they, they don't respond the same way. They, they worry about those situations more. And we need to be an example for them of faith around them, but not get frustrated with them, but to encourage them to keep trusting the Lord and believing in God. Those of us who have a gift of faith tend to expect others to have that kind of faith. We need to hold them up in prayer and encouragement and in love. And it says, be patient towards all men. We've got to be patient towards each other. Be patient in their sinning. Be patient in their... I don't mean we have to agree with their sin. It just means we need to be patient with them in their suffering. We need to be patient with people who want to change. And we need to be patient for those, with those who do not. Because if we're not patient, then we'll turn away. And we'll, keep, we'll, we'll stop planting those seeds in their life. And so we need to keep working and, and, and allowing God to do the work in them. Christ was patient. To, don't, don't forget this. Christ was patient towards us. And He still is. How loving and patient He must be. Because He's still working on me. Oh, wow. You know, those of you who know me know that was the first song I sung as a kid. He's still working on me. But how loving and patient he must be. Because he's still, thank God, he's still working on me. Thank God, he didn't give up on me. Thank God, he is a patient God. And his love is patient towards me. We should be that to people around us. His love is shown through his patience for us. And we must show compassion without compromise. In verse 15 it says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves, both among yourselves and to all men. Do not render evil for evil unto any man. Don't spend time trying to get others packed. Let God handle it. I feel like I'm speaking to somebody watching that you need to stop trying to get revenge and you need to start allowing God to do that work. And you need to move on. We need to remind each other of this. David is the greatest example of this in Scripture. Saul, was, Saul had tried to kill him multiple times. Saul was hunting him down when he cut the edge of Saul's garment off. When he went into the cave to relieve himself. And he didn't know David and his army were in there. David came up and cut the edge of his his robe off. Saul had no idea. Saul, David could just as easily have killed him. His men wanted to, but he told them not to. David went through the trouble of going down to show Saul how much, he, how much mercy he had on him by going down and, and, and taking his spear while he was asleep and taking his uh, jar of water and then showing Saul that later. David's a perfect example of one who didn't render evil for evil, but let God handle it. And in the end, God did. Jehaziel said to Jehoshaphat, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou king Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Jehaziel spoke the word of the Lord to Jehoshaphat and said, look, don't keep trying to fight. You just keep being obedient. God, let God handle it. And then later on, we see he did. And when they began to sing and to praise, wow, I could stay there and preach on that for a minute. When they began to sing and to praise, we talked about that Sunday morning. When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and, and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. When they made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. God took care of the problem. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we will try to do too much and try to be God instead of letting God take care of the situation. Don't, don't try to get people back. Allow God to work on men's heart. Allow God to work on them in, 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 in their minds and, and, and talk to them and speak to them about the things that they have done. Paul then begins to give them instructions on worship in the last days. 
As Pentecostals, we assume that we know how to praise and worship. And that's what distinguishes us from other dominations in most people's eyes is the way we worship. And thank God for that. Thank God we're free in our worship. Thank God for Pentecostals, us Pentecostals who are free in our worship, who know how to shout, who know how to lift our hands, who, who will dance before the Lord, who will run if God, if God uh, gets a hold of us. But thank God for the worship that we had. But sometimes I believe we get comfortable with coming to church and worshiping in a certain way. But we don't worship like that at home. It's a shame that, we've, that, that God's got to wait till Sunday for some of us to worship. This bleeds over into our church services because when we come here, if we're not careful, we, we, if, we, if we would worship at home, it wouldn't be a chore to worship at church. If we would worship God throughout the week, then when we come to church, we would come church ready to worship God. Our praise team should just be people who sing a song and to lead us in music and be anointed in doing that, but, but they shouldn't have to cheerlead people to worship. The praise team in your church shouldn't have to cheerlead you to worship. It shouldn't matter what the song is. It shouldn't matter who's singing it. The God that you serve is worthy of your praise. And we should be worshiping all Him through all out the week so that we come together. We can worship together. Paul tells them how to do that. What should we do? Verse 16, he says, Rejoice evermore. Put a smile on your face. Have joy. Complaining is a sign of a lack of trust in God. We need to worship God. We need to, we need to give glory to God. And we need to be excited about who we are in Christ. I just listened to a song. It's a new song. They just wrote in the midst of this uh, situation that we're going, this epidemic that we're in right now. And, and, and uh, I heard Kim Collinsworth, the Collinsworth family, sings this song. And she talked about how uh, at this time, there's a lot of things that's been canceled. Uh, graduations have been canceled. There's been weddings that have been canceled. And, and, and loved ones who have passed away, you can't even really have a funeral the way that you normally would. There's things that are being canceled all around us. But the, the title of the song that she sung says that, that joy is not canceled. Why? Because our God is still alive. He's still on the throne. And we still have joy. We still have peace. And we can rejoice in that tonight. Verse 17, he says, pray without ceasing. Chapter 1 told us that the word ceasing, it, it, it talked about praying without ceasing in chapter 1, but this doesn't mean, and we talked about that earlier in our Bible studies, that it doesn't mean uh, continually, without stopping, it means continu um, continuously, repeated frequently. We keep praying frequently to the Lord. We keep a mindset of prayer. You want to stay sanctified? Stay connected to the sanctifier. You want to stay holy? Stay in communication with the Holy One. Stay in an attitude of prayer. Verse 18, he says, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Notice, he does not say, give thanks, in every, in, for everything give thanks. He says, but in, in everything. It didn't say to give thanks for everything that happens, but it says in the midst of everything we should give thanks. Job gave thanks in the middle of losing all his possessions and children. He didn't thank God for the fact that he had lost his children, but he praised God in the midst of his trial. We gave thanks to God for what he did have, even in the midst of his situation. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18 says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the oil of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. We can have joy in the midst of of our trials. We can give thanks in the midst of our situations. A sanctified church will be a praising church. A church that is truly holy before God will not have to stir up praise. They will come in ready to praise. They live their lives to give thanks to God. Verse 19 tells us to quench not the spirit. That word quench means to put out the fire of the spirit. Don't hinder what the spirit wants to do in others. 
Let God move in their lives. And don't get in the way of what God wants to do in your life. Don't quench the Spirit of God that wants to do mighty things in your life. For some of you, that might mean that you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I would encourage you to seek that. Don't quench the Spirit of God. He wants to do great and mighty things in you, and we need to allow Him to do that. Despise not prophesying. God will use men and women of God to warn His people and to instruct them. In this time, Thessalonians, they needed the prophecies even more at that time. The New Testament was not established. In fact, this might have been the first book of the New Testament was 1 Thessalonians. A lot of people believe that. So they needed those prophecies. They didn't have the Word of God to turn to in the New Testament. Prophecies were a vital way for them to get instruction on what God was speaking to the church. And God still speaks today in prophecies. And in the teaching and preaching of His Word. And we need to hear the Word of the Lord and heed to it and walk in it and not just be hearers but be doers of the Word of God. Verse 21 says, Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Don't just trust what people say. Prove it. Test it. Find it out. Walk in discernment. Line everything up with His Word and don't let go of the good. Hold on to the good. And then make sure you're understanding the things that people are saying are not all of the Word of God. Beware of false prophets, the Scripture tells us. And then it tells us in verse 22, the last thing he tells us about worship here is abstain from all appearance of evil. Avoid those things that others might perceive as evil. Most of us ask, what's wrong with doing this? But I believe a better question would be if we ask what's right, what's positive, and what's godly about doing the things that we're doing. Are we lining up with the things of God? Is it appearing to be evil in other people's sight? I don't want to hinder anybody's salvation. And, and I know we can't be worried all the time about what people think about us, but if there are things that are in our lives that we can get rid of that are hindrances to other people, then it's worth it for the kingdom of God to do that. And we need to avoid the very appearance of evil in our lives. We don't want to do anything that's going to hurt our testimony. And then in verses 23 through 28, in the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read until all the holy brethren are still being read today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Paul ends his letter with prayer and encouragement for the Thessalonians. His pastoral heart rings out with a desire for his people to stay holy and sanctified so that we be found blameless without spot or wrinkle when Jesus comes back. In verse 24, Paul reminds them of the one who saved them and gave them their calling. He's also faithful to preserve them and make sure they're kept and protected from the things of this world. In verse 25, he says he then it says Paul is talking about how he feels um, and how he want what he wants them to do for him. And he says, pray, brethren, pray for us. He asks them to pray for us. He's talking about him and Silas and Timothy and other leaders of the church. It's important that you pray for your leaders. They face many challenges and bear the burdens of the people. Be in prayer for those who rule over you, that they may be able to lead effectively and with the anointing of God. I pray that you would do that for me. Whether I'm your pastor or not, I pray that you would do that for me. You would pray that God would help me and that God would give me strength. That God would continue to anoint me to do His work. And in turn, when we pray for our leaders, it always benefits us in the long run because the leadership that we're under is going to benefit us. If they're anointed, they're going to refresh us. If they're strengthened, they're going to refresh us. So we should pray for those who are leaders over us. Verse 28, and this is the last scripture. 
But Paul always prayed grace on the believers. If we're going to be the leaders, brothers and sisters of Christ, and the worshipers we need to be, then we need his grace to make it. His grace is not just for salvation, but his grace keeps us every day. His grace strengthens us, strengthens us, and keeps us every day. So I want to end you, I want to end by asking these two questions. And these are other questions that you can ask as a family. Who in your church fellowship needs your support and patience? And that might be something you ask yourself. Who in the, your church fellowship, whether you go to this church or another, needs your support and patience? And secondly, how could you pray for your pastor and other leaders in your church? And as you pray, recommit yourself to trust him and to keep yourself spiritually whole that you might be a worshiper of God and that you might do everything that Paul encouraged us to do here in his word. Father, would you do that in us? Lord, we pray for all those who have rule over us, Lord. There are many in government that have rule over us, Lord, and, and, but we, we pray for them that they can make the right decisions. Lord, we thank you, Father. We praise you, Lord, for, for giving leaders in, to us in the church. And Lord, we pray for each one of them that you would give them wisdom and strength to do what uh, you have called them to do in these days. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the growth we're going to see in our churches as our leaders are strengthened by the prayers of their people. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I praise you, Father, as you help us to come together in fellowship and to encourage one another. Lord, that we grow stronger in unity as a church. Not just this church, but as a church throughout America, we would be united as we face these last days, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be worshipers, that you would help us to do what we have been encouraged to do tonight. And we'll give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. Lord, help us to stay holy before you, sanctified before you. And we'll give you all the praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you.